see this. Bless this place. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you for all worshiping together. I'm just uh, recognizing with Pastor Jim, our mobilization pastor up here, and his wife Susie, how much activity we've had recently. Uh, one of our sayings is, we gather to go. And uh, we want to create opportunities for you to travel with a purpose. And so uh, our team that's headed to New Orleans this week, um, pray for them. And it wasn't that long ago we sent a team to Cuba. And this week a team returned from Dominican Republic. It was just a few weeks back we packed, oh yeah, 400,000 meals and um, supported the disability uh, event that's coming this summer. So I'm just so grateful for this activity. And, and we're creating on-ramps for you to, uh, to say, yes, I, I can go. I can do that. I can go teach English in the Dominican Republic. Um, I can go to the inner city and, and be a servant there to help them get their facility ready so they can do a lot of ministry this summer. So uh, I love our spirit, and I pray that you will continue to pray about how you might join in one of those opportunities. Well, we're not big on symbols around here, in case you haven't noticed. We're somewhere between the plain Quaker meeting house, and have you ever been in one of those? I have been in one, and they just have nothing on the walls uh, by strategy for them to just uh, think of the Lord and not be distracted by anything. I've also been in a Russian Orthodox church where there were so many symbols and icons that uh, it was a bit much for me. We're somewhere between those two, probably a little closer to the Quakers. In fact, uh, on the other side of that wall in our first worship center, um, we worshiped there for a number of years, and to many of you's consternation, it's like we, we don't even have a cross which was an oversight, but we got it. And at Southern Oaks, we've got it, and, and appropriately so. But it, it does indicate that we as a church, as a movement, uh, don't have a lot of symbols. What, what is the value of symbols? Well, they allow us to explain the meaning behind them. We have an opportunity to tell those who come after us who may not understand the significance of an object, just why it means so much to us. And, of course, we hope that it will mean the same to them. Now, I have an abundance of symbols and memorials in my offices. Uh, some of you uh, use the word nostalgia. Others use the word junk. But they have meaning to me. So here's my grain elevator. If you're a farm person, you'll understand that this sat on our farmyard and grain went up into the granary. I, as a five-year-old, decided to play and climb up this elevator and then swing on the wires that were there, which were bare. And there was uh, so much electricity going through my little body that I could not let go. Somehow, miraculously, a brother of mine ran up and swiped me off. It should have electrocuted both of us, but somehow I was set free, taken down. Um, we called the town doctor who came out to the farm. I remember laying there on the blanket saying, am I going to die, am I going to die, am I going to die? And uh, he said I was going to be okay, but he gave some pills to my mother. <laughs> who had witnessed the ordeal. And I really have no uh, ongoing I I I I I issues from, uh, from that whole e e event. I'm good. I also have uh, this football card in my office. Uh, I do like football, but this is a special one. It has a man on it that God used to tell me about Jesus. He came to a fellowship, a Christian athletes event in my uh, community, in my state, and I was there. I was in the back of the room, leaning against the back wall, 
But something undeniable happened that night. Winston Hill, who played for the New York Jets, was there during the Joe Namath era, had a smile so big and a joy so full that I recognized he had something I didn't. He he knew Jesus in a way that I didn't, and that was the night I first believed, and my life has never been the same. So I, I keep this card as a reminder. Our story today takes us to an Old Testament book Joshua, where we learn about a pile of rocks that were erected as a memorial so that one generation could tell the next generation about God's miraculous provision and how the hand of the Lord is strong. As Sunday school children, we might have been so caught up in the dramatic retelling of this miracle by our Sunday school teacher that we missed the main point, and so we're looping back We're going to hear the story again, and I trust that today we'll understand what God was teaching through that miracle. But let's go back a little farther than Joshua, actually into the Old Testament book of Numbers for the backstory. We don't have this on screen. If you have a Bible, you might appreciate reading along. It's going to be Numbers chapters 13 and 14. I'm just going to do a brief summary of the events that are listed in detail there. After the crossing uh, of the Red Sea, escaping from the bondage of Egypt, the Lord told Moses to send 12 spies into the promised land of Canaan to check it out. They reported that it was what? A land flowing with milk and honey. 10 of the 12 came back afraid. They were afraid of the powerful and very large people that occupied the land. But two of them, Caleb and Joshua, said in chapter 13, verse 30, we should go and take possession of the land. We can certainly do it. We should go now. But in the next verse, we get the report of the cowardly spies, which ultimately swayed the people because they were saying, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. We are like Tiny grasshoppers compared with those giants. In chapter 14, we hear the people saying, if only we had died in Egypt or in the desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? Let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. And upon them saying that, Moses and Aaron fell face down crying out to God, Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes and said, we can do this. But lack of faith prevailed with the masses. And so the people of Israel were punished for their disobedience to the Lord. It says in uh, verse 29, in this desert your bodies will fall, every one of you, 20 years and older, except Joshua and Caleb. And so for 40 years, they wandered in the desert, eating manna and dropping like flies. They could have been in the promised land in less than two years after leaving Egypt, but because of this grasshopper complex, a generation died in the desert. And when the last unfaithful adult died, and after Moses died at age 120, not due to old age, but because he had some unfaithfulness as well, When they had all died, the story begins. The unstoppable plan and promise of God unfolds. And so we're going to pick that story up in Joshua chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, who was Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all the people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. And no one will be able to stand against you. And all the days of your life I will be with you. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people 
to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and be very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to, from it to the right or to the left so that you may be successful wherever you go. And keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get ready. Get your provisions ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Get ready, Joshua said. It sounds sort of like the last words of Todd Beamer on his flight 93 on 9-11. What were his words? He said, are you ready? Okay, let's roll. And the Lord said to Joshua, get ready, be strong and courageous. And then the timeless advice that we treasure Joshua 1, 8, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Once again at this juncture, Joshua sent two spies into the land to look it over. And chapter 2 tells about how those two spies went to Jericho to check it out. They were protected there by a local resident, a lady of the night, Rahab who told them, it's recorded in chapter 2, verse 9, she said, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Those two spies were able to escape because she hid them under some flax bundles on her roof and then they repelled down the side, the city wall, and then they laid low and hid out in the hill country for three days. They're like special ops forces here getting back to Joshua. And when they did, this is what they said. It's recorded in chapter 2 now beginning in verse 24. The spies said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. And then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance, about 2,000 cubits, between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. How's your conversion? Can you do cubits to yards in your head? It's about a thousand yards. Stay a thousand yards away from the ark. Then Joshua said to the people in verse 5, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. After 40 years, Joshua had to pick Springtime, when this Jordan River was raging with water, really, now is the best time. There are enemies sitting on the other side waiting to pick us off. We're like sitting ducks, you no know, dead ducks out on this river, and probably half of us couldn't even swim. But now, we need to go now. Apparently, the Jordan River in that location isn't what it used to be. The place where the people of Israel crossed over is not exactly documented, but by the benchmarks given us in the text, we can know quite closely to where it was. And in fact, it's quite close to where the traditional site of Jesus' baptism was, not the photo op area where some of you have been in Israel. That's a beautiful section of the Jordan River with steps down and a railing and photographers. But the most traditional site thought to be where Jesus was baptized is almost in this precise area where the people of Israel crossed over the Jordan River. At this point in time, during this peak snow melt and 
and springtime, it was probably 100 to 200 feet wide. Um, they say perhaps in the floodplain, maybe even as much as a mile. I visited this site in 2014, and it looks like this. Maybe not what you expected. It was reportedly much wider back uh, in the day when there was that snow melt off Mount Hermon. So we'll imagine a much wider river. Incidentally, doesn't this make you want to go to Israel and be baptized in that? <laughs> or would you rather be baptized in this? <laughs> Some of you are holding off to be baptized in the Jordan River. I get it. It's a special place. But I'm just saying... We have a baptism next Sunday. I'm so thrilled once again for us to hear those testimonies and, and see what God has done in people's lives. Okay, back to our text. We left off in uh, chapter 3, verse 15. And so, um, when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. The Jordan was at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, we know it as the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Certainly hundreds of thousands, if not a million of them. And when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. And in the future, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the water of the Jordan was cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. The masses of people that were there on the bank of the Jordan saw a swollen, impassable river. But God saw a dry riverbed. It's so illustrative of the way it works for us, I think. I mean, they literally had to take a step of faith to dip their toe into the water and it stopped. For us, isn't it the same that we have to take a step of faith before we can see how God is going to make a way? So they crossed the Jordan River on dry ground, and they carried those heavy stones on their shoulders to the other side. Why? So that in the future, when their children asked, what do these stones mean? The stones would be a memorial. A memorial to the people of God, forever reminding them of God's powerful provision in that place. So what's the big deal with a pile of rocks? Memorials and symbols can be good. They can be used by God as a tool, first of all, for us as individuals to, to look at them and, and to remember God's powerful hand, his deliverance, the way he worked over and over in the scriptures. And if you're in an encore group, one of our small groups this week, there's some extra study involved to look through Deuteronomy because over and over it says, do not forget, do not forget, do not forget. Apparently, we have a propensity to forget, and when we forget the things that God has done, it's likely to erode our faith. And so, symbols are a tool to help us remember what the Lord has done. They're also a tool for us to be able to pass along the stories who weren't, uh, of the miracles of God, the provision of God, to people who weren't there. 
people who are coming after us. These stones that came from the middle of the Jordan River became stones of remembrance. And now looking ahead to the end of chapter 4 and verse 21. He said to the Israelites, in the future when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. The hand of the Lord is powerful. That's the lesson we should have got 50, 60, 70 years ago in Sunday school. That's the main point. The hand of the Lord is powerful. And we are to have a fear of the Lord, not in a way that we're scared that he is going to punish us, but in a way that we have reverence and awe, a great amount of fear of the Lord. That's the purpose of the Jordan River miracle. Deuteronomy 4.9 says it this way, Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. I don't know if you've seen our pile of rocks here at Live Oaks. Outside the door on the Grove side, perhaps you always park here, you've never seen them, but we have our own stones of remembrance. They were erected in 2017 when we moved to this campus. They've been placed there so we don't forget the things that God has done in our midst. The ways in which he demonstrated before our very eyes the hand of the Lord that is powerful. Many of you weren't even here on that time. How many of you were here before 2017? Many of you were not here. You give us an opportunity to tell you the memories that come because of the power and action of a mighty God. What do those rocks mean, you ask? Thank you for asking. They remind us of his provision and his plan and his miracles witnessed by those of us who were here during that first five years of our church. The top rock there that you see that is a different color has the date 8-13-2017, the day that we had a parade from our Southern Oaks campus where we met in a rented facility. It was a sheriff's department caravan led by them. It was an awesome day, and it was the day that we opened the doors and worshiped for the first time. The verse that you see on there is this verse from Joshua 3.5. It instructed us that first things first, we need to consecrate ourselves. We need to be right with God. We need to be dependent upon God. We need to put him first at all times, and then let's watch, because he will do amazing things in our midst. And so now, seven years later, He has done more amazing things. 20 years from now, he will have done more amazing things. Incidentally, that top rock has been stolen. I don't know who does that kind of thing, but a replacement's been ordered. A lot of things have happened since 2017. We need some new stones of remembrance, frankly. I think we need a rock that says, come to the light. Because since that time, we have had our Christmas light and sound experience uh, tells the nativity story and literally tens of thousands of people have come during December in the last five years. We need a rock that says come to the light. We need also a rock engraved with the grove, that place where some people right now are watching and worshiping outdoor. We uh, built that knowing that it was going to be a great tool for concerts and movies And if there was ever a global pandemic, it would really come in handy, (laughs) which it did. And we praise God for that venue that was a place that we could continue to meet and worship. And to this day, it has served as an outdoor tabernacle. 
we should have a stone that says the grove. Perhaps a stone of remembrance, remembrance that, uh, that remembers the day that we voted. In this very spot, we prayed and we voted about building this. We were two months into the COVID pandemic, and you right remember all of the uncertainty in the world and in our own lives, but the courage of you people to say, we need to go. We need to go now. And so we did, and the Lord has allowed us to be blessed with this place. We need a rock to celebrate the unexpected opportunity to purchase the Southern Oaks campus, a place where we had met for five years in a rented facility, a place that was very special for us as we launched our church, but amazingly it came as an opportunity for us to buy it, and now it is a beachhead for us in we call it Southern Oaks. It's probably Central Oaks by now, but uh, we thank the Lord. And we need a rock that illustrates the succession plan that God has ordained to bring Pastor James for such a time as this. But let's look again at this existing pile of stones. If you've never stopped to look at it, you've look, been looking at it now for a few minutes, and you're saying, what do they mean? Thank you for asking. Well, not many of you were here during those first five years. It's starting on February 19th of 2012, that big stone that says once a month church. We met at the waterfront inn. It was a very special time for us as our little band of 40 people maybe that we thought might attend, uh, and God did a great work, and we were so excited meeting once a month in that place. There's a stone there that says WWCR, that's Wildwood Country Resort. That is what it was called before it was our Southern Oaks campus. It didn't look as nice as it looks now. And in fact, every week after we worshiped, we had to turn the chairs around to the other direction because the residents in that community played bingo during the week. We were glad to own it and not have to do that anymore. You see the Christmas Eve miracle there in the lower center. In 2012, when we were, again, just less than 100 people for sure, we inventoried our people who will be here for Christmas, and we could have easily fit in one service, but the Lord led us to offer four services at the waterfront in that night at 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 o'clock. And we just remember how God moved in that place that night over 400 guests that came and it taught us something. It taught us to trust God for things that don't always make sense. We taught us to dip our foot in a swollen river and believe that God will do amazing things if we trust him. You see a rock there that says the sunrise service because a special part of our history was the first two years of our existence we met at Lake Myona Park. We outgrew the parking lot and so we looked for a new place and so in 2014 we met at the Polo Grounds. I was up in the crow's nest of the polo grounds watching in the, uh, the, the dawn of the new day. It was actually quite foggy, and through the mist came 253 golf carts. It was like a field of dreams picture of you build it, they'll come. We held it, and they came, and over 600 people attended on that Easter morning, and we just said, only God. There's so many stories about these different rocks, I can't tell them all. I can't elaborate on the significance of each of them, but there is a book that tells about them, uh, the book that I just finished writing. And uh, I'm so excited that this book, Play Hard, Pray Hard, Finish Well, the Finding a God-Honoring Balance in Your Second Half of Life has uh, just been published. They're ordered. You can pray with me that they'll be here by next Sunday so that you can each have a copy. What this book does is it celebrates all that God has done in this place. But if you don't want to wait, you can order now on Amazon for the low price of $9.99 for the paperback, <laughs> only $4.99 for the Kindle version. And if you order today, we'll throw in a free Live Oaks magnet. <laughs> Truly, they're out there, but next week you'll get a free one, so. Why did I write this book? So that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful 
And so that you might always fear the Lord, your God, as it says in Joshua 2.4. And so we don't forget. Deuteronomy 4.9, only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen. Or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to the children after them. We have a story worth telling a story that needs to be told, told to your neighbors and to your children and to your children's children because it's God's story. And you have a story of redemption. I heard you sing. I heard that worship that came from transformed hearts. You have a story to be told to your neighbors, your children and your children's children. Only be careful. Do not forget the things your eyes have seen. The things that God has done, do not let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we adore you. We, we love you. We worship a powerful God, a strong God, a God who can do miracles, a God who literally stopped up the water so that people could pass on the dry land. We've seen you act here. We've seen you create opportunities and pathways and provisions that went beyond a reasonable request, but you acted in such a way that it was only you, and we thank you. We pray that you'll give us the courage to tell the story, to tell your story of your power, the story of what you've done in this place, in your church, and the story of what you've done in our lives as you've changed them, redirected them, transformed them. We are grateful people. Allow us the privilege to tell that story and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.